Hey everyone, what's up? It's Dr. Charlie, physical therapist here. And in today's video, I want to share with you four reasons um, as to why your current approach to uh, trying to fix or resolve your back, butt, and or sciatic problems is not working and or not working as well as you would hope. So I want to help uh, sort of create some clarity for you here and shift your paradigm around how you're approaching this very painful problem. For those of you who do not know me, again, my name is Dr. Charlie Johnson. I am a physical therapist. Essentially, what I do is help people all over the world uh, by giving them, teaching them the tools, uh, knowledge, and giving them the understanding slash support needed to solve these issues um, on their own so that they can be self-sustainable and not have to rely on other people to fix them. If you're curious as to what could be the cause of your back butt and or sciatica type uh, issue, go ahead, check out my DIY diagnostic guide where I literally go uh, sort of inside my brain. I throw it all out there. Um, and show you sort of the algorithm and the way to sort of think through uh, figuring out what could be going on. So check that out. It's a download and click the link above. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so we're going to talk about, again, the four reasons why your current approach to solving this is probably not working as well as you would hope. And uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through them one by one. So the first reason, the number one reason why you're probably working really hard to try to solve this and it's not getting you to where you want to be uh, is due to confounding variables. So let me explain. So every day I chat with folks who have tried everything and my response is kind of like, hey, that's actually really great news because you realize that trying everything means not trying any one thing. And because of the interaction between so many confounding variables, the end result of doing many different things is just chaos, confusion, and essentially you feeling clueless. A lot of people uh, tell me this to say, hey, I just feel clueless. I feel lost. I don't know where to, to uh, start or where to go, right? Um, you're just not sure what's working or what's not working. And here's how experiments should work. So you have a couple different things to consider. And really, big picture, you have independent and dependent variables. And an independent variable is essentially a stimulus, right, uh, that is changed by a scientist to create an effect on the dependent variable. Dependent variable is the outcome or response, right, that you're sort of trying to explain or track, right, and they influence one another. So because you're the one in pain and the one in control of how you think and move your body, and this will become more relevant later, but um, you're the scientist. You're the one who actually has to solve this if you're looking for a long-term solution. So the independent variable in this case is the treatment that you're doing to try to solve your problem. And the dependent variable is your pain level because my guess, if you're watching this, you want the pain to go away. So you're trying to track that. You're trying to see, right? Um, if I do this, what will happen, right? So all experiments are born from a simple question or hypothesis. I wonder if I do this thing, right? What will happen to this other thing? In this case, right? X would be, um, you know, the independent variable, the treatment or what you're doing there. And Y would be the dependent variable or the outcome of interest. In this case, pain relief. I wonder if I do this treatment, will it help my pain or will it not? And so you can see here, it's pretty small, so we don't have to even read through it. It's just the idea that, look, there's many independent variables. So your pain is the dependent variable. That's what you're trying to change, the outcome of interest. You're trying to reduce it, right? But there's many different independent variables. And I just stopped here. There's probably many, many more, right? That aren't even on here, but just off the top of my head really quick, we've got exercise, we've got stress, we've got sleep uh, sort of routine or hygiene there. We've got posture. And then within each of these, you've got many things. Is it posture or position when you're walking, sitting, sleeping, standing, driving at work, et cetera, right? Um, what you eat, occupation, so what you do for work, right? How that work setup looks, um, life events, birth, death, moving, other experiences that can also elevate the pain experience, um, modalities, heat, ice, cream, stuff like that, other treatments, all the other options that maybe you've uh, considered or maybe you're currently doing, right? Massage, chiro, injections, etc. Beliefs, what you believe, what you know about pain, what you don't know about pain, etc. What you've been told um, as it relates to your condition your diagnosis maybe, and then exercise, right? Uh, and there's many different ways you could go with exercise. And this is just the, the sort of um, top of the iceberg, right? So there's many different independent variables which could influence the dependent variable or the outcome, your pain. So just based off of this, you can see how complex and multi multifactorial this problem or this pain experience becomes. There's a lot of variables, right? And it's because of this reason that asking the question of, Dr. Charlie, what exercise do I do? Very specific question, right? As well as trying everything, very general approach, doesn't work for most people in pain, right? On one end of the spectrum, just asking the question of, so what exercise or exercises do I do? Fails to recognize all the other things, right? It doesn't appreciate the other variables that could be confounding. It could influence your pain experience. 
right? So if you just look at exercise, at least you're narrowing it down to one branch, right? But within exercise, there's many different things you could do. And then outside of that, right, it's ignorant of all the other things that could potentially influence this. Right, so on the other hand, trying everything manipulates so many other variables at one given time that it invalidates any potential conclusions or results of the study. So it muddies the water and makes it difficult to understand the relationship between right, cause and effect or correlation and effect um, between what you've done and sort of how you feel. So for example, you know, doing an entire sheet of exercise at once, changing many different uh, independent variables, introduces confounding variables, many interactions there. And it may result in a change in how you feel, right? Dependent variable for either same, better, or worse, right? So you're here, you're in pain. And when you do something, it can either make you feel same, better, or worse. And that's it. But if you feel better, why? If you feel same, why? If you feel worse, why? So without isolating variables and setting up a, prop a proper experiment, it's basically impossible to make any, make, uh, any sense of what you're doing. And the more you do, the less scientific the experiment, the more confounding variables you introduce, and the more confused you become. So you might start to ask yourself, well, like, hey, I'm having more or less pain today, but like, was it the stress I had at work? Was it the way I slept? I wonder if it's the new shoes. Was it the chiropractor, medication? Was it a combo of two or a few or whatever? Right? And these are all valid questions, but you just don't know because you're not sure how to run experiments. And again, it's not your fault. You're just looking for relief. And healthcare providers are often no better and they're just as confused, right? They're the ones giving you the sheet of exercise. They're the ones telling you to do this or um, you should sleep like this or you should sit like this, et cetera. And they're just doing it based off of theory in most cases um, and not running a really scientific experiment there. So some might say, look, who cares, Charlie? I don't care. If it works, it works. I don't need to be scientific. I just want to feel better. And I get it. But this is where we start to bring in the question of, are you looking for short-term relief or are you someone who's looking for um, relief long-term, right? So are you stuck in this short versus long-term thinking loop? So the number one predictor, this is why this is important, the number one predictor of future injury is prior injury. And this is why I suggest that you think long-term, meaning if your back hurts today for whatever reason, chances are good it will hurt again in the future. So wouldn't it be wise to learn throughout the healing process what works and what doesn't work, right? And to be able to look back and say like, no, I tested that and that doesn't work. And no, I looked into that and that doesn't work or it does work. Wouldn't it be used to learn as it relates to your specific issue, right? Well, what, what does and what doesn't work and all those things involved so that you don't need to recreate the wheel if slash, if slash when things occur in the future. Right? It's like, if you don't have time to do it right now, when will you have time to do it over? And I think this is useful, right? And so I'm a long-term thinker. I just got off the phone with somebody who's 37 and their back has gone out over the years, multiple times. And yes, this person wants pain relief, of course, immediately, just like everybody else. But long-term, I'm not worried about him getting better in the moment. Long-term, I'm worried about him right, in the future such that if he doesn't have the tools, knowledge, and understanding, and doesn't do a good job of learning from this and seeing this as an opportunity, right, to learn and gather information and feedback, then in the future, he doesn't have that, right? And if he doesn't have a toolbox in the future, then it just keeps reoccurring and he's out of control. He's disempowered. So think of it like this, you know, imagine if your mom or grandma, whoever, right, never recorded and passed down their favorite recipes, right? You'd be starting from scratch, trying to reinvent, reinvent the, the famous, uh, grandma's chocolate chip cookies, right, uh, on the holidays or whatever from memory, from scratch. And you'd probably totally be screwing things up. And that would be unfortunate because they spent so many years perfecting that process. And now you just have to try to reinvent it. You have to do all the work again. So again, if you don't make time to do it right the first time, right, you're going to have to make time to do it the right time or the right way later. You can't manage what you don't measure is another concept that I sort of share within the process and program right, of helping people through these issues, right? You wouldn't expect to throw a bunch of random ingredients into a bowl and come up with anything worth eating. Same goes for getting out of pain. You've got to have a process. And this mentality of just tell me what to do so I can get out of pain is short-sighted and fails to recognize the complexity of the pain experience. And it doesn't equip you for down the road either, right? It tries to bypass the scientific method and shortcut what is needed to truly learn from and solve the problem. 
So the second reason, right, that most treatments fail is because they violate this idea of like the 80-20 rule. And essentially, right, it's this idea, look, 80% of your results will come from 20% of your efforts. You might be doing 10 different exercises, but two of them might be most valuable. You might be changing, right, 10 different things in your life, but two of those changes are going to give you the best, the best bang for your buck. So if you spend one hour a day, just think of this hypothetically, receiving treatment for your condition or doing exercise or something to solve this, or you have 24 hours in a day. So what about the other 23? So 96% of your day, the majority of your day, almost all your day is spent doing things outside of treatment. And so this 80-20 rule, right, raises the question of where are you putting your efforts? Where should you focus to get the most bang for your buck? So instead of giving time and attention to optimize the majority of your day, 96% of the day not spent doing treatment, again, if you exercise for an hour a day or you're doing something for an hour a day to solve the problem, right? Instead of optimizing the healing environment to your life, people focus on trying to figure out what to do with, you know, just that hour or just those 10, 15 minutes of time they spend treating. So we'll say, you know, one to 4% of their time, hoping, right, that that little change here will move the needle in their favor towards relief. So it's just very myopic, very narrow perspective. They're focused here when they spend so much of their time outside of treatment. And look, little motions that you do here or there might help the problem, right? But the truth is that you can't out-exercise a bad diet. And I think this makes total sense. If the treatment you're receiving doesn't seem to last, works temporarily, or if you've ever said to yourself, I go to the Cairo, I go to PT, I get massage, and it works great, but then the problem comes back again. By the time it got to the car, it comes back, or the next day, or the next week, whatever. If it keeps coming back, then it's because you're focusing your energy on the wrong things, right? Spine surgery, Cairo, massage, PT, exercise, right? Dry needling, essential oils, anything can help temporarily. But the real change comes from focusing on learning what you can do, gathering the tools and knowledge and the understanding right? To optimize your healing environment during 96% of the time you aren't in treatment. This is the big needle mover to begin with. So work smarter, not harder. Harder means like doing all these squats and doing all these deadlifts and doing all these stretches, right? And laying down and making time for it when you could optimize the environment first. So the first step to getting out of pain, right? Is to learn how to become a good detective, how to isolate variables and learn to dial in on what things physically and mentally need to optimize things physically and mentally first, right? So that you can create a life environment that is conducive to healing, right? So this is really where we need to focus. Again, you cannot exercise a bad diet. You can run on the treadmill all you want, but if you eat donuts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then you're, you're going to have a really hard time losing weight. It would make more sense to stop eating the donuts, and then the effect of exercise will be, well, greater. Same thing. You can do all this stuff, but if your environment physically or mentally is not conducive to you getting better, your life is not cleaned up, then the chance of that small amount of treatment working is not good. So instead of asking what exercise or exercises do I need to do for this problem, kind of looking to someone else, right, for the solution, a better question to ask would be this. Who do I need to become in order to solve this problem? So a little bit of a shift, right? This is a big picture, introspective, sort of systems-oriented um, question. And this is a really sort of interesting paradigm shift and one that's needed for most people to heal. And so look, this leads us nicely into the next reason, right? The number three reason or the third reason most treatment fails is because it focuses on fixing you instead of teaching you how to fix yourself. So in this scenario of someone fixing you, you laying on a table and somebody giving you a massage, or stretching your leg or cracking your back or giving you a shot or whatever, you aren't changing. Right? Someone is trying to change you with their hands, right? manipulate you with their needles or their scalpel via surgery. Right? And this often results in short-term changes that usually don't last. I'm not saying never. I'm saying they usually don't last because you're basically a puppet in the process and someone else is pulling the strings. And guess what? Unless they live with you, it's only so useful. So this is interesting, right? So um, imagine a conversation going on here. So here's this guy somewhere off YouTube and there's this wood burning stove, right? And he says to the wood burning stove, he says, give me more heat and I will give you more wood. And then the wood burning stove looks back at him and says, give me more wood and I'll give you more heat. 
really cool quote, right? Because it's this idea of like, hey, sometimes we get things in the wrong order when it comes to producing the results that we want. We're trying to get what we want, right? Kind of silly too, because the fire clearly won't give him more heat until he gives it wood. It can't burn nothing. It needs fuel. So expecting pain relief to just happen to you without learning how to first change what's within you in order to become someone who is able to relieve themselves of the pain and has the tools, knowledge, and understanding to do that, right, especially long-term, is a real struggle for so many people. Most people just, number one, they aren't used to it, right? And medicine basically breeds one of um, you being a passive player within it, right? You go somewhere, somebody does something to you, and then you leave and you go home, right? But also, there's no process there. Right? The real reason that this occurs and people feel like, okay, I don't really know what you mean by that, Charlie, is because they don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. You might not know where to start. Right? You don't even maybe know what this looks like. Essentially, they don't have a process because they haven't been taught it. They don't really know why they should do what they should do, right? when to do it, how the person that they're working with arrived at that conclusion, and how to make decisions for themselves as it relates to their health. Right? And again, this leads nicely into reason four, and they kind of three and four tie in. The fourth reason treatment fails is because people focus on pain relief, not the pain relief process. It just makes sense. Think of it like this. Everything in life involves some underlying process. You could come up with a million examples, right? You don't just pop out as a baby and you're like able to run. It doesn't happen, right? There's a process. You learn to roll, then you learn to sit, then you learn to crawl, then you pull to stand, then you learn to stand, then you walk, then you balance, right? Then you learn to hop and then hopping, both feet, one foot, right, eventually becomes running. And you just can't skip these steps. Sure, there are little nuances and every baby maybe gets there a little bit different, but pretty much these are, the, these are the steps, right? You didn't just magically learn to do your job or learn to do a specific hobby. You took baby steps. You followed a process. You learned the fundamentals of what you do, right? So if you uh, are like in software or something like that, you probably learned how to Number one, like turn on a computer and then the basics of it and then the basics of programming and code, and this and that. And eventually you put it all together. You apply the concepts over and over and over again, practice, right? Combine that and compounded that over time and became, right, good at whatever you do. So, you know, last little example, be crazy for someone just starting out in music to jump to playing a super complex piece like Mozart or something like that. I know nothing about music, but Mozart I heard is pretty darn good. So first, look, they learn their instrument. This is how it works, okay? Um, they learn sort of um, the scale of music, right? Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. That's all I remember, right? The sounds, like, ooh, that doesn't sound like a B. That sounds like a C, right? And again, without knowing much, I know maybe a little bit, right? That's kind of the idea, right? So you learn some basic principles. And eventually, by understanding the principles or the fundamentals, right, that drive um, performing good music, a musician is able to play what is placed in front of them. So the person could sit there if they love piano, do, 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 and you could put another sheet in front of them and they could probably play it as well. Right? So there's no need to memorize every single song out there. Somebody says, whoop, I know how to play piano, but I got to go home and for a week, I've got to memorize everything. No, they understand how to read music. They understand again, what it sounds like, et cetera, right? Why? Because they understand principles and the principles are universally applied to anything that comes in front of them. So instead of trying to treat a disc problem, a sciatic nerve issue, piriformis syndrome, SI joint, arthritis, insert whatever the heck you want, folks get so focused on the individual issue and resolving it that they fail to understand that there is a universal healing principle or process or universal healing principles or a process which apply to resolving all pain regardless of diagnosis. So moment to moment, day-to-day -day variations in pain are common. Morning, you're good. Afternoon, you're bad. Morning, you're good. Afternoon, you're bad, right? And diagnoses are just a dime a dozen. Depending on who you go to see will determine what you're told is wrong with you. And with fluctuating pain levels or changes in diagnosis, right, it's easy to ride that roller coaster of emotions, right, feel confused and start sort of chasing different treatment paths. This results in like squirrel syndrome or shiny object syndrome. One day you feel good, so you're like, I don't need help. Next day you feel bad, and you're like, I need help, and then I'm going to go do this, right? And moment to moment, you're just jumping all over the place. But do you know what doesn't change? This goes back to the example of the musician, right? The baby, etc. The process. So every human learns to walk in the same way. Every person in pain follows the same exact process to relieve. It might look different from a high level, but it's not. No problem is too unique or different because it's the process that matters first. And if you focus on the pain relief process, then pain relief naturally follows. 
what's really cool about having a process is it removes you from the emotions of day-to-day -day ups and downs and moment-to-moment -moment ups and downs. Pain relief goes, do, 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 do. Oh my gosh, all over the place. But the process like, no, no matter what happens, this is what I need to know. So remember the slide, right? You've got kind of your pain as the dependent variable, the thing we're trying to change, right? And then you've got all these other things that you could tweak or play around with, exercise, stress, sleep, nutrition, work, heat pack, ice pack, et cetera, all this stuff. The first thing we need to do is we need to start to get some clarity, right? So we don't focus on exercise to start, right? We start to look at, okay, how can we start to deductively narrow down from all this stuff that possibly could be a problem? How do we start to narrow down to sort of the root of this? And where do we begin? And for most people, it starts with their beliefs, their beliefs about what pain is, what pain isn't, any understanding or misunderstanding of those things, any thoughts, fears, worries, concerns, anything they've been told about their pain or their condition. So we've got to switch the mental frameworks there and make sure that the brain and the sort of, again, mental frameworks are conducive to healing first. Then we start to look at physically the environment, help you understand habits, routines, blind spots, right? That are keeping you from healing. And we continue to build. And we use this process of, again, going from all this stuff that could be, right, to narrowing down, right? And deductively figuring this stuff out. What happens is you start to do this as you get more clear on what you're experiencing and why you start to, instead of just being like, oh my gosh, like, I wonder why that hurts. You start to say, wow, that totally makes sense. And I didn't even notice that I was doing that. These are the types of things that folks um, who work with me start to say, you start to have aha moments. And then we say, okay, well, what about exercise now? And look at this point, right? The thought that enters most people's brains is okay, Charlie, I, I see the way that you're thinking. You're thinking very scientifically. And I can do that. This makes total sense. So I'll just try one thing and see what happens. And I guess you could if you want, right? But here's the problem with that approach. Number one, it's inefficient because you're just guessing, right? But without a process of figuring out what to do, where to start and how to like go about narrowing things, again, you're just guessing and you're just randomly doing stuff, right? This is you making random choices. I should do this or I shouldn't do this based on what you think, which what you think might be outdated or somebody maybe told you this is what you should do for this problem, which may or may not matter, right? And so it's just kind of like built on sand. Your decisions are built off of a poor foundation of understanding about what you should do and why, right? There's no evidence or support to guide you, right? And this generally results in frustration, exhaustion, and again, confusion. So instead, right? And this is the opportunity I would see for somebody like yourself, right? It's useful to learn a decision-making framework for understanding what you should and should not do. This is a big question that people come to me with. They say, hey, Dr. Charlie, I'm having this problem. How do I know if I should do this or I shouldn't do this? And what to avoid, right? So you save time and energy and money too, right? So that you know where to begin and how to tell if an exercise is worth doing, a waste of time or something you'll want to avoid. So that you don't just go buy a new mattress because you think or were told that, that it's your mattress that's the problem, right? It's an evolving process of assessing, testing, reassessing, right? And isolating these variables to determine the impact of them. And finally, there needs to be right, an understanding of the healing journey, including how to get back to activity. So if you start to feel good, you just jump back to going on runs? Well, maybe or maybe not, right? It's probably a more scientific way to go about doing that. How do you handle setbacks? Setbacks or flare-ups will happen, and they are probably meant to happen. You learn more from failures and or mistakes, if you will, right, uh, than just being perfect at something. So if you never fall off the bike, how do you know how to get back up? So there is no such thing as failure. There's just feedback and setbacks are a really great way to give you some feedback and practice the process of getting out of it. And obviously there's talk about prevention. There's nothing out there as hundred percent foolproof, but we do have some evidence to show that, Hey, if people do this, they're generally better off, right? Versus if people do this. And I can promise that you will be much better off if you have the tools, knowledge, and understanding, right? And support to resolve this now and in the future. So here is the, pain relief process that I teach folks. Okay. And I teach folks this with inside my glute relief accelerator program, a sort of specialty coaching program. Um, and step one is you need to, again, optimize the environment. You cannot exercise the bad diet. Okay. Under, um, learn to be a detective, uh, sort to start to understand or uncover the blind spots, habits, routines, things like that mentally and physically that are keeping you from getting better. Learn to self-assess. You can't manage what you don't measure, right? You need to work, know where to focus your efforts. Then you've got the mind and movement as medicine. You've got essentially different inputs and there's many of them, but how do you know what you should do or you shouldn't do? So learn that decision-making framework so you can start to make decisions for yourself no matter where you are in the world, um, now and in the future. And then getting back to life. How do you deal with setbacks? How do you deal with 
getting back to activities that you love, and what do you do about prevention? So again, here are the variables, right? These again are the four reasons that most approaches um, fail to really help people get to the root of these issues. And they don't, most importantly, they don't empower people long-term to have the resources, right? And the knowledge that they need to be self-sustainable. Confounding variables, violating 80-20 rule. Confounding variables is doing so many different things, right? And not appreciating all those different things. So how do you narrow that down? Right, the 80 20 rule is this idea of like, hey, there's probably 20% of what you'll do will probably give you 80% of the results. But how do you figure that out? Right, what that 20% um, of time and attention, where it should be, what it should be focused on, so you can get the most bang for your buck. Fix me versus help fix myself. Um, it's useful to go somewhere, but you're relying upon that person to evaluate and fix you. And then how useful is that for you, like long term or when you go home and you don't have them? Right. So, really, um, the ultimate solution to most of these problems and to give you the best chance of solving this is to teach you what you need so that you own it. Right. And then, pain relief versus pain relief process. Pain relief um, or pain levels go up and down. We have good days, bad days, et cetera. But a pain relief process remains constant throughout. So, this helps you become less emotional. This helps you sort of stay focused, right? Objective. And um, again, gives you a process that you can go back to um, when times are tough. All right. So, hopefully, that is useful. At the end of the day, just understand that uh, the goal is this. I want to help you be efficient. So you can see here, there's a lot of input for little output. And you're doing a lot of work, and you're not getting much out. Or here, there's very little work, right? And it's giving you a big result. So we're looking for asymmetrical returns, right? We want to take a sniper approach, not a shotgun approach to solving this. So um, you know, on the left side there, you see, again, you're doing lots and lots of stuff, probably trying lots of exercises, buying new cushions, doing all the stuff that people do in pain. I get it, right? But it might not be getting you to where you want to go. So it's a lot of work for very little um, output or relief in this case, right? Or you can learn how to focus, narrow things down, isolate variables, begin to think like a scientist, do very little and get a huge return. That is the goal. Asymmetrical returns in your favor in the, in the case of pain relief and then knowledge, tools, and understanding so that now and in the future, you are in the best place to solve this. So you've got to trust the process, whether that be mine or somebody else's, but trust the process. Look for a pain relief process that's been proven over and over and over again. And that is it. That's all I got, everyone. Hopefully, this was useful. If you found this valuable, please hit the uh, like button below. Uh, also, comment. Let me know what you thought, where you're at in that process, right? Do you feel confused? Do you feel lost? Do you feel like you have a focused approach? If not, let me know. Would love to hear your thoughts. Um, and then please subscribe for other like videos. Thanks, everyone. Until next time, chat soon.